sound up there? Thank you everyone so much for coming. Thank you for having me. I'm going to talk about concerns. I told you that I wanted to share it week after month after month some different things about the wiles of the enemy. If we can learn the tricks of the enemy, we will be so far ahead of his of his game. We need to get on top of this. We need to learn what's going on. And I'm I've been privileged to experience by just by working with people every day for year after year after year, you can learn the tricks that the enemy uses. So I'm going to show you another another trick tonight, and it's very very powerful. But the, the good news is that we have we have a remedy. We have a we have a solution that is so powerful. So I'm out tonight to prove to you that my theory is not only real but that it works, and that you have something that you can overcome the wiles of the enemy in such a powerful way, it is beyond imagination how far you can take it, but it's up to you. So I'm going to share with you a lot of stories because stories are cool. And stories, stories help us understand that this is real. These are real life stories. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. But, um, <laughs> you will get the idea. And I want you, as I tell you these stories, I told from different different age groups and different characters, so you can get an idea how does this fit into my family. And I'm sure you're going to see in some places how it will fit in with your family somewhere. And so we're going to talk about concerns and how the enemy uses them and uses us. We all have concerns for the people that we love. We have concerns for our husbands. We have concerns about our wives. We have concerns about our children and our grandchildren. We have concerns about our dear friends. Tonight I would like to focus in, because this would be too large, but I want to focus tonight on parents, about our children and our grandchildren, about how the enemy could be using this against us. As parents, what are some of the concerns that we have for our children and our grandchildren? We have concerns for their health. We have concerns for their safety. We have concerns for them having a good relationship with us, a loving relationship. That's a huge concern, right? We're concerned that they do well in school. We're concerned that they have good friends. We're concerned that they're going to learn to love God and have a relationship with Him. Are we concerned that they will grow and they will find a loving spouse? Maybe even Believe it or not, find a, a, good, a great career for them. They'll be self-sufficient. These are all good concerns that we have for our children and grandchildren. Everyone agree with that? The problem is, the, uh, the fact is that the enemy does not want us to see our children succeed in these areas. He does not want to see these wonderful things happen to our children like you and I do. So he is going to do whatever he can to keep these things from happening. But here's the key. He is going to use us to, to ruin those wonderful things. He is going to use us to come against and to work against those things that we want in our children. And you might say, what is he talking about? Now you're going to blame me for my children not succeeding. So right from the fact you need to know this is a trick. And all of us fall for it. If you are a good parent, you will have fallen for this trick. If you are a bad parent, you will not fall for it. Because you're not concerned. This is about concerns for our children and our grandchildren. I can give you an example. I'm going to believe that you are all good parents. A man came in my, my office with his whole family came in um, about a month ago and this child was completely out of control. He was four years old. He was bouncing off the walls. He was just interrupting us constantly. He was rude. He was arrogant. He was, you could not believe what was coming out of this boy's mouth. He was totally disrupting our whole time together. But I looked over and I saw him even, he was playing this big game. Right? And I said to his dad, who I was praying with his dad at the time, and I said, what is your son watching? He says, oh, I don't know. He says, 
some stupid game. I said, let me see that. So he brings this game, the boy brings this game over, and I'm looking at this thing. And in this game, you've got this person, this boy, walking through this haunted house, and you've got these creatures that are jumping through the walls and devouring this boy walking through the house, and it's ripping him up and shredding it. This kid, and it's like, are you aware of what your son is playing? And he says, oh, he says, I don't know why he plays that stupid game. He says, he plays it. He'll play it 12 hours a day, every day. I said, can I slap you? And I said, I'm not believing this is, I said, you're not aware of what your son is watching. He said, it's the only thing. He said, I just, I just can't believe that he watches that stupid game. I said, who's the parent? I said, aren't you the parent? Aren't you, don't you have any control of what he watches? And he acted like I was from Mars. Like, what right does he have to interrupt this boy's? Well, this kid was filled with curses and spirits that had to be cast out of him. before. And then, he, then the boy calmed right down. And I said, your homework is to destroy this game. You better take aware, be aware of what this boy is watching. So there are bad parents, and they just don't care. It's, these things will not affect them because they just don't care. They, don't, they, will not inf they will not bring these things upon their children because the enemy can't use them. The kids are already going to be lost, but different ways. Okay, so we're dealing about, we're talking about good parents that are going to be tricked into affecting our children in negative ways. We are only one of many ways, and I have to remind you again that it's not saying you did this to your children. I have to say that up front. This is just a way that the enemy uses to make loving parents bring about the exact opposite of what you like in your child. And because the enemy uses the people closest to us. You have to understand this principle. The principle is we send emotions one to each other. God has designed a network of communication that we were designed to bless one another. So this is a system of waves that we send to one another that's real. Uh, quantum physics proves it, that um, we do send messages to each other, and they are very, very real and very powerful. We can go back to World War II when they began uh, splitting the atom. But they went and when, they, when, they, when they split the atom, they realized that they could study these particles. They could see the neutron and the proton, the proton they could see the electrons spinning around. And they realized they could study the inside of an atom. But then they went into subatomic and they began splitting those particles. And then they realized that they could no longer study them. Because if one person looked at them, they moved a certain way. When another person looked at them, they moved a different way. Every person looked at them made them react a different way. So in my, by learning this, I realized this all makes perfect sense. That we are designed to affect one another. Because when I think a thought, I'm going to move particles in your brain, and I'm going to I'm going to just send you wonderful messages or negative messages, and how and how we take control of these thoughts is how we develop our children in the purest way. Paul says we need to take every thought captive. Why? Because our our thoughts that we think are just to ourselves are deeply affecting our loved ones. In this case, deeply affecting our children. And I'm about to prove that tonight, that this is real. I used to think years ago that we would say a blessing for someone. I'd say a prayer and I'd say, God, oh, please bless my son, bless my wife. That I was just shooting up a prayer up to heaven, and then God would just shoot back down a blessing to that person. And he would say, then I realized he would say, no. He said, that's your wife. You bless her. That's your child. You bless him. And that's the responsibility I'm giving all of you tonight. For your children, your grandchildren, you bless them instead of cursing them. Okay? It's very, very real. That choice is yours. I'm saying that right up front. And I'm about to prove to you that this is real, and it's pretty exciting. Because there is a way to understand it, and it's not complicated. So I'm going to begin by telling you a story. So... Family came in. It was a well, it was just a mother and father. They, first of all, they, they called and they said, "You know, we'd like to bring in. We'd like to send in our 16-year-old son. He is having a lot of problems." And I said, "Well, that's not the way it works." I said, "They said, well, he's very angry. 
he is sad and depressed, he's lonely, he has no friends, he's not interested in sports, um, he has a terrible relationship with his mother, and you know what, he even hates her for the father's telling me this. He said, uh, he, does, he does poorly in school, his teachers don't like him, he's not even interested in sports, and, and he's completely dissatisfied with his life. Can we bring him in? And I'd say, no. I said, I need to see you all together. And he said, why? He's the one with the problems. And I said, well, because you're the problem. <laughs> Now, a lot of parents don't want to hear that up front, but if, they, but if they're good parents, and these were good parents, they want to say, what, what are you talking about? And so I share a little bit to them about how we send emotions one to another. And I said, would you like to find out if you are sending any emotions to your son that may be bringing about maybe exactly opposite of what you had hoped in him? And they said, well, this sounds intriguing. And so they came in. So they talked more and more about this boy. I learned all about this boy, about all those things he was suffering, about so angry and so sad and so depressed, and no having no friends. And I, as, I, as I talked more about him, I realized he was a very, very smart boy and had a very, very powerful temperament, but it was completely reversed of what he was capable of. So I began to listen. So the story goes on that the mom said, she told me, began to tell me the story about how when she was pregnant, she had, she had an attack on her hip that was excruciating, just unbelievable pain, and we found out later it was an enemy attack, but it was the most amazing knife in the hip pain 24 hours a day. And it was, it was just literally unbearable pain. I, I can't stress enough how she stressed this pain. She said, I said, tell me some of the things that you felt while you had this pain. She said, these were, these were some of the things I was feeling and worried about while I was pregnant. I won't be able to nurse my child or even hold him. I won't be able to get down and play with him on the floor. I won't be able to take him on play dates with other children. I won't be able to sit with him and help him with his schoolwork. Listen, these things are very important. You're going to get the step, you have to listen. I won't be able to take him out and do fun things with him. I won't be able to play catch or soccer with him. I won't be able to have any more children. I will always be depressed. So she's telling me, these are the things that were going through my mind the whole time I'm pregnant, right? So now we find she had concerns. So the key word is concerns. It all begins with concerns. I need to tell you what her concerns were, and we wrote them out. As she described them, I wrote them down. Because I am unable to hold my son, or nurse him, or carry him, or get down and play with him, he will always be disappointed in me. He will be angry at me and hate me, and we will never be able to have a loving relationship. Right? This is going through, this is a concern, just a concern. Right? Because I'm in such agony with his hip, and, un and unable to speak sweetly to my son, but sternly, because she's in such pain, everything comes out sternly out of her mouth, he will never be loving towards me. Because I'm unable to give John a sibling, he will always be sad and lonely. Because I am so sick and unable to take John to be with other children, he will always be alone and will never have any friends. Any of this sounding familiar? So what he, as I described the boy in the beginning? Because I am so overprotective of John, I am living in fear that he is going to grow up without sufficient self-confidence and self-assuredness and will do poorly in school. Because I am unable to help John with his schoolwork, he will do poorly in school. 
Because he will do poorly in school, none of his teachers will like him. See this brilliant reasoning taking place? Because I'm not able to play catch or soccer with John or do fun things with him, he will never learn to like games or sports. Because I am sick and depressed and not able to give John the best, I am sure he will feel that he is insufficient and always lacking something and will, de and will be depressed and unhappy with his life. This woman is telling me all these concerns she had while she was pregnant and then while she was raising him, all these concerns. And then I said, am I the only one in this room getting this? I said, do you see any connection between the way you described him and your concerns? You know what, thing, you know, you know what her first response was? Do you mean to tell me that I caused these things in John? I said, would you believe that you are a major influence? Would you believe that? And she said, I'm getting it. I'm starting to get a picture um, of what's going on. She said, I didn't realize anything about sending emotions. I, of course, like, like all of us, I felt these emotions were just inside of me, and they were not affecting anyone. So she said, what do we do? Is it hopeless? I said, we need to turn around these things. So the first thing we do, I wrote them out, but you, what you heard was called a lie. You see, a lie is something when we say the words always, never, everyone. When we start to believe those things, they are actually a lie. It's like saying, I will never get a job. I will always be sick. We say them out of frustration, out of distress. But we say the word always and never, and then the enemy takes over and says, I can work with that. Because that's a lie. It's not, you're not always going to be this way. And chances are this, things are going to change. It would, even with or without you, they're going to change. So he uses these lies. But we, as we come to believe something so strong, it actually becomes a lie. So we have a formula that I can share with you all later that we are, use a formula to break these lies. We break them, when I said, and we renounce them, and we loose them this person from this lie. Now you have a clean slate. Now you've broken it. You're stopping to send those messages that you're sending in the gazillions. We're sending them to those we love. In this case, she was sending those messages to the gazillion, and they actually all fermented and became true in this boy's life. He had no other real influences except for this. The, the father was actually very positive, very joyful, and very happy. So it wasn't coming from him, but in this case, it was coming from this very... But she was, let's give her a break, she was in intense pain 24 hours a day. Yeah. Now, on a little, a little note of how healing is so real, I have to put in this commercial for healing, because this is 10, this will now have 16 years later. She can barely walk up my stairs to my office. She was still in this pain. Not as intense, because they don't try all kinds of treatments, but she was still in intense pain. We all, the first thing that God called us to was to lay hands on this woman. We prayed on her. She was healed instantly. She had suffered for 16 years and could have been healed, but just didn't know it. She was healed, and she walked out of my office and down the stairs, and she said she was ecstatic. So she, this, now see, why did God do that? Why would God really be into that kind of healing? Well, because God knew, he said, we got to turn this boy. He's after the boy, right? He wants that boy healed. So I got to get mom into the positive if we're going to get this boy healed. So maybe that's why he just really responded. This woman is instantly healed. Now she's full of joy, right? Now I have some, now I have some room to say, why don't we turn these lies into affirmations? And then I'm going to tell you what happened, because there's, what would be the point of this, right? Each story has some positive conclusions, you see? So we, together we wrote these. These are called, and this, I'm giving you examples because this is what you're going to do when you go home. You're going to write down the concerns I have for someone that I love very much. You're going to get, I need to give enough so you get a picture of how to do this. And then we're going to turn those into truths and affirmations. And those you can say every day, as many times as you want, because believe me, the person hears them. If we 
believe curses are real. We believe that we say negative things, people feel them and they experience them. We know that. We all believe that. Why are we unwilling to believe that blessings are so real, that we have the power to bless? We understand we can curse each other, but why am I? I have the toughest time believing convincing people you can really, really bless your loved ones. In this case, we're blessing our children tonight, right? So we wrote these together. I love John with all my heart and give him the very best I have. John knows I love him and deeply desires a loving relationship with me as much as I desire one with him. Now, think about the lies, the concerns that she had before. We, are, we cancel those out. So he's no longer hearing them. And now he's only hearing mom's blessings. Right? It's true. As many times as you say them, and then God multiplies, I'm going to explain to you how God multiplies your blessings and why it can happen so quickly. John and I are going to learn how to communicate with each other and begin a loving relationship. John is extremely gifted and talented and is going to achieve great things. He is going to do well in school and find a wonderful career that he truly enjoys. Now they believe he is totally capable of these things. They're not making up Mickey Mouse of, oh, he's going to be the President of the United States, he's going to be an astronaut. These are things that based on his skills and his temperament, these are things he absolutely can acquire. And so they are breathing life into what they believe is true. They are filling him with truth. John is going to be thrilled with his accomplishments and is going to love his life. John is fun and outgoing and truly loves people. He is well liked by his classmates and teachers and is going to have many good friends. John is going to realize how blessed his life really is and is going to become happy and content with his life. Pouring blessings after blessings. She says, I'm going to do this. I am so... She was fired up. So she goes home. And she just, she spent the whole morning just reading these blessings and blessings. She says, i got to catch up for lost time. So she began just pouring these blessings into him. And he would know, she's just, she's just saying them. He's at school, right? And she's just speaking these blessings into him. This boy, every time she picks him up from school, he's angry, he's depressed. He's miserable. She picks him up every day from school. In fact, she'll say, good afternoon, John. He'll say, no. I mean, just negative, negative. She says these blessings. This is in one morning. This is, this is a little, no, I have to, this is a little amazing, but we got, really, she was powerful, and God stepped in. She picks him up from school, and he comes to the car, and he's smiling. And he's cheerful. And she's like freaking out. She says, did, so, did something happen today? Did you get a, award, a big award today? Did you meet a girl? He said, no, nothing. Did anything different happen today? She's already trying to discredit it, right? Did anything happen today that makes you so happy? I said, nope, it was a normal day. <laughs> she goes home and she does it again the next day. And she prays again this furiously over this son. I mean, she's just really making up. She picks him up again. He's cheerful again. This is after two years of miserable. I mean, they spent the first four sessions just telling me how miserable this kid was. I was very much indoctrinated in how depressed this boy was. And he hadn't smiled in years. And now, two days in a row, he comes and he's cheerful. So you say, well, how is this even possible? Well, you have to know how much God is all about blessings. When you say a curse to someone, let's say you even think a thought, he's never going to have any friends. He's never going to do well in school. Let's say it's worth one point. It's one curse that you speak to your child. And, and the person hears that very clearly in the spirit realm. When you say a blessing, God is all over it. 
And so what I've learned that you read in Scripture, it says God multiplies, He increases the blessings by up to ten times. So I came to understand that if you say a blessing, God immediately is all over it. He increases it times ten. Now it's worth ten times what your curse was. Say it once more, he increases that ten, now what have you got? You've got a hundred blessings into John. Say it again, you've got a thousand. Now if God is working his maximum, and I believe he was with this woman because she was in desperate need, he is multiplying it, increasing it by the thousand. Now this comes from a, an, an ancient a biblical concept of God restoring what the locusts have eaten. So if I were to say to you, this is a very interesting concept, to understand that God, in, that God works on the increase. This works with your tithe, this works with your blessings, with all these things, God increases them. And so, let's say that you and I are both farmers, and you come out one day and you tell me, you're not going to believe this, the locusts came in last night, they completely devoured my wheat. And it was about this high. It was completely eaten to the ground destroyed. And I say to you, don't worry about a thing. I have a, I know a technique. I can restore your wheat. When you come out tomorrow morning, you will see your wheat restored. What would you expect to see? Where would you expect to see your wheat? Right there, right? Same place it was. In the Hebrew, that word, restore what the locusts have eaten, means it's above the ceiling. It's up to ten times what it was. Because God has to outdo the enemy. He's not going to just say, well, just hit for ten. Right? What happened when Moses threw down his staff? And it turned into a snake. And then the, then the, the um, sorcerers of Egypt, the Pharaoh, they threw down their staff. And what happened? It turned into a snake. You know what happened? Right. God will not be outdone by any stinking enemy. Moses' snake eats them to show that I am, I always have to show you that I am more powerful. So that even if I had some trick that I could restore your brain to this height, I can't make it grow ten times what it was. I don't care how good a magician I am. Right. So that's why I want you to be excited about doing your blessings for your loved ones because you have to know this principle. It's not as difficult as you think. God will increase them by 10 every time you say them. This woman said, if that's the principle, I'm saying them all day. She recorded them. She listened to them when she's driving. She's just blasting her son with these messages. Okay, it gets better. Just to stay on the same story. This is what got me really rolling on this theory. So she says, and I didn't even know this, but she had more concerns that she told me about later. As she told me this whole story that I'm going to tell you now. She said, I had more concerns about John. See, John is a slob. John's room is an absolute pigsty. He says there are things growing in there that you wouldn't want to even look at. It's just so nasty. So these are her, so she puts down her concerns. John is a slob and will always be a slob. This is what she says, I, every time I walk by that room, every time I walk in, these are the things I think, she says, I'm being honest with you. He enjoys living like a slob in this clutter. He will never clean his room. He is too lazy. He will just depend on me or someone to do it for him the rest of his life. He will never learn to be neat and organized. She said, I'm telling you, I said those things every time I walked by. I was disgusted with John. So she decides, if this worked with his smile, maybe we can do something about this problem in his life. So this is what this is the, the truth that she wrote. John, and these are all true, by the way, but if you're looking at when he was young, she just reminded herself of what John was really like and what he was capable of. John has always been very detailed and very precise. He loves things neat and organized, with everything in its place. 
He enjoys being able to find things quickly and easily because his room is so organized. John has a deep respect for himself and has a good self-image. He feels good about himself and comfortable when he is sitting in his clean, organized room. He feels proud about his room and will invite friends over to hang out together. She's trying to cover a few more bases there with this thing about getting some friends into his life. And so she said, I stood in his room and I just prayed like this over John and over this room and I just spoke these words. I did it for 20 minutes. I just spoke over and over and over again. And then she left. She picked up John from school, and then she came to see me. Then she picked up her husband, and those two, she, John was at home, and she came, they both came to see me. She didn't tell me any of this. They came back again the next day, and she is freaking out. She says, I have to tell you, after we left you last night, I went home. John's room is immaculate. <laughs> She said, she just stood there and she said, she stood there in shock. She said, did your father tell you to do this? He said, I didn't see that. He says, you guys dropped me off. You guys, he said, did, you, did he call you and tell you that you better clean your room or you're going to die? <laughs> no. John, he said, dad told me nothing. She said, I didn't tell him because I gave up months ago. I was like, I'm feeling, you can just, you want stuff growing under the bed, fine. She said, it was unbelievable. I said, I like that. It's believable. You see? <laughs> but that's her first thought. It's unbelievable. But this is a true story. Though, but she, I mean, she speaks with power. So we see, the same power that she had to curse her son, this woman had the boldness and the determination and the power change that boy around. It is night and day difference. Alright, I'm going to tell you another story. These are, now I'm going to give you some other examples. Uh, this was about a girl, she was age nine. This is a very, very amazing, amazing story because this girl, you have to know, was completely, I'm going to say demonized. She was an adopted girl had very, very many demons in her because of that all comes with the adoptive problems and the rejection is huge. And so it invites in a lot of oppression, a lot of negativity. And there was many, many lies this girl had believed. But she was extremely violent, extremely vulgar, powerful and controlling. She controlled the whole family. It was a family of four. She controlled the whole family. She was so powerful. And she had everyone just running scared. She was so violent and so aggressive. And so we began looking at what were some of the concerns of the mother. And then I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to give you a different method. I'm going to show you the, the concern and then the truth that we wrote. Everything I do with Jane has to be difficult. Her truth. From this point on, everything I do with Jane is going to be peaceful, fun, enjoyable, and successful for both of us. It will always be hard for me to believe Jane, because she always lies. Jane knows her Bible and understands that God is truth, and that we must always speak and believe the truth. We will continue to encourage her and praise her for always speaking the truth. See the word different, I'm saying truth. I'm, I'm just pounding her with the word truth as opposed to the word lies. <coughs> Jane will never listen or obey. She will always do only what she wants to do. Jane is very intelligent and totally capable of understanding us the first time that we speak. We're going to teach her and encourage her to do what we ask her to do and to do it the first time we ask her believe that concept. Parents cannot imagine that that's possible. I've, I've helped so many parents get their children to do things the first time they ask. But, the, but they, it's not even a possibility until they break that lie that you never listen or you will never do it the first time. You'll never do it the fifth time. 
break that lie and start saying, from this point on, you will be saying you will be obeying the first time, and they do. Whenever Jane does not get her way, she will be angry. She will scream, yell, hit, say hurtful things, and be disrespectful. So you may say, well, well, that's what she, you just, you know, that's what she does. That's what she always is. I'm just reporting, I'm just thinking about what she does. So my point to you is, when did it begin? And we trace it back with many, many, many parents and find out that we, because we don't know how often we have to think something before it becomes a really pounding you with this thought. So maybe this girl in the beginning was this way. Okay, she was this way. So I remember I said in the beginning, and warning you are saying that you are not causing this behavior, but you are increasing it ridiculously in the gazillions of times. The more frustrated you get, the more angry you get, the more you want to throw this child out the window. <clears throat> Believe me, you are multiplying these, this behavior. You, are, you may be very well causing exactly the behavior that you don't want. The behavior may have been taken care of, but by, but by me amplifying, because as parents we are such power, we have such authority. We are as powerful as the doctor wearing the white jacket. Those people are invincibly authoritative because they have the white jacket. Anything they say, we believe. Right? Well, as parents, we have that same amazing authority. We're going to continue to teach Jane, and she will understand that her way is not necessarily the best way or the most beneficial for her. But instead, what we are suggesting is the best for her because it comes from our love for her. See the difference between the messages? Jane will always believe that she is inadequate and not good enough because she was adopted. Jane is going to see herself exactly the way God sees her and the way we see her. As beautiful, smart, gifted, talented, creative, expressive, loyal, powerful, and funny. She is beautifully and wonderfully made by God exactly the way he designed her from the beginning of creation. She is exactly who she needs to be and equipped with all she needs in order to do exactly what God has called her to do and to be in this life. Jane will never be able to receive love and see herself as lovable because her birth parents rejected her. Sounds logical, right? Remember, everything I'm saying, you say, well, that's just reality. What about when you're told reality gazillions of times? We become what we're told. We become what we are. Every day when I looked at my three-year-old daughter and I saw her, the way she colored, the way she was inside those lines, I said, Angelina, you are an amazing artist. I didn't say, say you will be. I said, I breathe life into her. I said, you are an amazing artists who are so creative. Look at the designs that you can do at three and four years old. Guess what Angelina is today? Phenomenal artist. I said to my, my daughters, I said, you are amazing dancers. You're so creative. You're brilliant the way you choreograph. This is at five and six years old. You are such amazing dancers. You're so gifted. Guess what they became? Amazing dancers, talented, creative. We breathe life into them. You choose. This is your choice. You can either hear these concerns and you can just stop them because now you understand a principle. They are definitely reaching my children. I can turn this around much quicker than what I thought. My relationship with Jane will never satisfy her because she will always want more. As we continue to help Jane heal of her inability to receive love and attention and Filled, she is learning to be content and satisfied with our time together and with what we give her. This woman began breathing and breathing this truth into her daughter. The father also. This is a this is a team effort. The father and the mother every day are saying these truths into this girl. They're speaking them over and over again. So they came in. A week ago. Now I have to
to show you, I'm going to tell you some more tricks of the enemy. So they came in a week ago, and they came in and they said, you can't believe the morning we've had. And I said to my guidance, I said to myself, hmm, good sign. And they said, what are you talking about? It's a disaster. Our house is, a, is she's worse than she's ever been. Right? And I said, this is a great, I was so excited. They said, you're nuts. They said, you're absolute, now you're really crazy. And I said, well, let me explain. I said, what is the hardest yard to win in football? One yard line. Why? Because you are right on the edge of winning this game. One more yard and I pushed you and now guess what? You've lost and I won. They will defend. That entire team is ridiculously powerful trying to protect that last effort that you're going to make to win this game. And he makes, believe me, believe me, I've been doing this for 30 something years, he makes every effort to push you back. That's the point that most people put. I have to be honest, and I try to get them back, they are so beat up, that's when they usually quit. And I say, no, you're not getting it, this is a great sign, right? And so they said, okay, right, okay, we trust you, but boy, this is, he said, we think, we really felt lonely here. We are losing big time because now she's worse than ever. I said, don't, in the one yard line, don't they fight harder than they have the whole game? I've watched games where there have been four plays and they can't get one yard. Yet they've just marched all the way down the field with, you know, 30, 40, 50, 99 yards and they can't get one. What's going on? Believe me, it's real. He want, the enemy watches football. He knows. <laughs> Use the same tactics against us. So now we began praying with the children, and their names were the ones the Holy Spirit chose, and each one had curses that they began. We would call them lies, but actually they were lies that they began to believe. I didn't. I didn't tell you, let me tell you the whole list, but just the, the last ones that came up were absolutely fascinating, and you'll get. So we're finding out the Holy Spirit's revealing these lies that this person, that this girl is stating. And she said, because I am losing control, I have to be even more defiant than ever. Because I am, because in order to regain the control I had over my family, I have to be even more loud and vulgar and and it was one after the another of this. Now, what do you hear, right? I see the smiles, right? I said, to, so the parents, are they're so freaked out, they're not getting it. I said, do you see what I'm seeing? And they said, no. I said, look at the word here. Regain what I have lost. Gain back what I have lost. What I lost, that means we won. We won. Your prayers worked, because that's the only thing they're doing that's different from years of therapy with this girl. It's the only thing that they did different, that they could really put their fingers on. They began speaking truth and life into this girl. And I said, you have won. Now he's trying to regain. They're on the, he's on the one line, and he is done. He's finished. Now you pour on the attack, right? That's what that's what they're that's what they're doing right now. I had the same experience. This is real. It's real. It's real. I had the same experience with another another boy and girl who were both adopted, both causing the same kind of violent, amazingly powerful behavior in their family. Especially this little boy, another one, nine year old boy. He was also causing this kind of. And we began praying and praying and praying. They were praying these, just speaking truths into these children. Lists and lists of them. And the children were changing. We saw amazing results. Amazing, beautiful. These children, the same children that, that, to give me an idea how powerful and violent these kids were, the father was 250 pounds, could not hold that boy on the ground in my office when he had a rage, one of his fits of rage. Powerful. Demonized. I mean, it's so powerful. 
The same boy was now sitting in my office playing with his Legos, just playing there and just smiling, happy. It's amazingly powerful. Last Saturday, they come, and the mother comes up the stairs. She said, what a morning we've had. And I said the same thing. I said, here we go. Here we go. Means we're winning. Do you know that the exact same things came up with this boy? His was, because I have lost. He was felt completely beaten. He said, I have got to, I have got to do. And his list was so amazingly powerful how he was going, he had a whole plan. I'm going to turn mom against dad, I'm going to turn dad against mom, I'm going to get, he, the kids are tricky, clever. Now he's only an influence by, by the enemy, of course, but he had a very clever line of attack, how he was going to win back his control of that family. Amazing, the parents got so excited. We broke those lies, the kids, they went, now they went right back, now we're, they were in the best place I've ever been in. This is about four months we've been working together. This is after five years of trying every therapy known to man. Thousands and thousands of dollars. Four months together, and this child has completely turned around. So I believe me, I said, this is, this is very, very powerful. What we speak into these children is real. It's very, very powerful. I'm going to read you just a few more. This was a girl, 32 years old. Also, she was, this girl was suffering from an addiction, very rebellious, very much wanted to be independent on her own, and just fighting and fighting everything these parents are trying to come up with. Mary will always yell and rebel until she gets her way. The truth, Mary will learn her temperament and use her God-given talents to help others glorify God. She will be able to handle her emotions well. Mary will never be able to manage her money. Mary has demonstrated that she can handle money when she was working as a waitress and paid all her bills. See, we're finding some evidence in the background that this, these are true. These are things we believe that are true in our children. And so we draw them out. She is responsible and generous to others with her money. She will never be a responsible adult. This one comes up a lot, a lot with frustrated parents. Mary will be responsible and live as an adult on her own. She will grow in maturity and will be great in whatever job she takes on. Mary will always need prescription or recreational drugs. Mary will not want or need drugs to alter herself. I believe she will choose good, natural health. She will never be a good driver. Mary is fully capable of becoming a good, responsible driver. See, they can be very simple answers. They don't have to be, like, the woman is a little more explicit, but they can be whatever you want. Mary will always date inappropriate men. Mary has high standards and will be looking for a godly man to be her husband. She will not settle for anything less. She will be an irresponsible mom. Mary loves children and will be a great mom with common sense and, loving, and a loving, godly heart. She will take care of her children and give them the very best. Mary will always have a sloppy house. And we can identify with that with her children. Mary likes order and cleanliness and will take care and pride wherever she lives and will have a clean and organized home. One more. Anybody for a few more? Are these, help, are these helpful? Yeah. yeah. See, they, they, they're all different, so they're touching different areas of your focus. This was about a boy named Ned was 17. Another one, very, very rebellious, very arrogant, very proud, just a life of nothingness, a life of disaster, um, hating everything about his family. Ned will continue to separate himself from the family, especially me. This is the mom writing these. Ned is a very important member of this family and will draw close and will draw close and gain understanding from all of us, especially me. I believe Ned is stealing and will get caught and have a 
record which can cost him his future. So many parents with rebellious children have this fear. So many. I can't even describe. He's going to wind up in jail. I just know. Yeah, I'm telling you, he's going to wind up in jail. He's going to have a record. His life is ruined. Never be able to get. They have all these things. Because these are concerns, right? We're good parents. We have. We were concerned about these things. I told you about bad parents. They just think, ah, do whatever you want. I don't care. I'm busy about getting my own career. I'm worried about my own fun. The things I'm doing. They don't really care about their children. They'll wind up with this. You realize, many, many parents have told me, listen, he had a choice. He can choose whatever he wants. So if he screws up, yeah, it's his deal. It's his bag. These are not good parents, right? All of us that are speaking here are talking to good parents because we have concerns about our children. Ned, Ned knows and will obey the Ten Commandments. He will walk in the light of truth and become a leader through the mistakes he has made. I believe Ned is separating himself from God by protection, from God's protection by committing sin. Through us praying for him, Ned will, Ned will grow deeper under the protection of God, no matter how badly he messes up. This woman is bound and determined to turn this boy's life around. And I am I am her number one cheerleader. I said, we are going to do this. And I share examples with her from others that see this is real. This is going to take place. It will take place. So a final, just a final little story to let you know, how do I come to understand this? How did I come to understand that we can truly influence one another? That parents have a deep, deep influence on children. I learned when I was studying, studying the Bible, and I was studying Jewish culture, and I learned to me the most fascinating thing, it's my favorite thing I think that I ever learned. I learned that when, in ancient Israel, when a woman becomes pregnant, she sits still. She sits in a room and the next of kin, the closest relative, will come and will take care of all the household chores for six months. That's why Mary went to see Elizabeth. She was following a real tradition. So during those six months, the woman, the mother's only responsibility, she sits quietly, she's peaceful, and she sings psalms and hymns to the baby in that room. That's all for six months. She teach, she's sharing with that child the love of God. She is fulfilling. She reads the, she was in memory. She, she would just sing the Psalms day after day, hour by hour, into this child, telling her how much she loves that child, the loving family that child is going to be born into, and especially that there is a God who loves you so much you can't wait to come out and meet him. Right, so this she does this for six months. I said, "What is going on?" They understood this two thousand years ago, and so this is the power that I believe we have available to us. We have to realize what is it I want to sell to my child. It's up to me. If my purpose is to sell the truth. I have to be excited about it. I have to, number one, I have to believe it. I have to believe in my child. It means I have to imagine, who is this child really? What is this child's potential? I'm not making up, I'm not making up stuff. I'm saying, what do I really believe? What have, have I believed about the child's potential? You breathe that into that child. I was at a potluck dinner once. And we were all standing around at the end of this table, and there was a bunch of us standing around, and there was some pies on the table. And this woman is standing there, and she's eating this banana cream pie, and she's going on. She said, wow, this pie is delicious. She's just eating. She said, oh, my gosh. She said, this is the best pie I've ever tasted. And she's just going on and on. Finally, I said, wow. I said, I have to try this. I said, do you know who made this pie? 
She said, I did. <laughs> I was so excited. I said, wow. I said, this is, I said, so we all tried it. And we said, you know what? She's right. This is really good pie. What was her purpose? Was she just bragging? What was her purpose? Now there was pies all over the table. What was her purpose? What was her goal? Add another ingredient. To what? Add another ingredient. You know, no, what was what was she trying to get us to eat, to, eat the pie. to eat the pie? Right, she wanted to sell that pie. Her goal was to get, so she was going to tell the truth about that pie. Now, all of us—it was four or five of us—we all tasted it. It was really good pie. She was not making up something about this pie, trying to convince us. Well, you know, maybe if I boast, if I really boast it up, they'll taste it and they'll say, "Yeah, it is good." No, she just we tried it, and it was really good pie. She was speaking the truth about this pie, and we accepted it, and we enjoyed it. Suppose she was sitting there, and she's tasting this pie, and she said, oh, this could have been better. Oh, this is like, uh, you know, and we're all watching already, which pie should we select, right? And if she's there complaining about this pie, would you take a bite of that pie? When you go see a really, really great movie, what's the first thing you do? You can't wait to tell somebody, right? So let's say you saw this movie and it was really great. And so your friend calls you up and says, hey, what do you think about, what do you think of that movie? Nah, it was okay, I don't know. He said, was it, nah, no, I don't, I don't think I'd, I don't think I'd recommend it. You know that you wouldn't go. But if they ran and rave about it and it was great, you just, you can't wait to get there fast enough. We couldn't wait to pick up it. We all hoped that there was enough pie left for us to taste because this woman had made such a deal about it. <laughs> I am willing to promise you that if you sell the attributes of your children this big, as excited as you are about banana cream pie, as you can be that excited about the potential of your children, you will breathe life into them. Amen. God bless you.